Welcome back to Palisade Radio. I'm Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is David Keller. He is the chief market strategist from StockCharts.com, the president of Sierra Alpha Research, the author of the Market Misbehavior blog, and another blog called The Mindful Investor. How are you today, David? I'm well, Tom. It's good to join you. Great to have you. It's pretty crazy to have so many different things on the go. But on your Market Misbehavior blog, you have a wonderful reading list with everything from technical analyst books to market psychology and even somewhat lifestyle driven books. So I was thinking we could start by discussing maybe a couple of those and give us a couple instances of where some of those books have really informed and or really highlighted different parts of your investing thesis. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny, I, we, we were talking before we got started just about, you know, uh, different disciplines and how uh, you and I have related them to investing. And for me, you know, there are certain things that I tend to draw on. And I, for the longest time in my career, I tended to separate my professional interests with my personal interests. And my professional interests were market history, technical analysis, trend following investor psychology. But then on the side, I'm a musician and, uh, you know, studied psychology. So I think a lot about mindsets and also then mindfulness and meditation, aviation. So I'm a student pilot. And the moment I started realizing that combining the personal and professional interests made life a lot more interesting and also, you know, sort of leveled up my conversations with clients and with peers, I started to do more and more of it. And so, you know, a lot of my work on, on the market misbehavior blog and my own firm and with stock charts is really taking the lessons that you can learn from other disciplines and applying it to investing. Because at the end of the day, when you're an investor, you're making decisions and Unfortunately, your brain is hardwired to make a lot of those decisions poorly unless you are setting up systems and practices and routines in place to help you minimize the emotional impact on your investment decision. So a lot of the things that we can read from, you know, hopefully some of the books I'll share with you, I think, you know, they inform your decision making in a pretty powerful way. You know, you mentioned the book list. And I was looking through them again. And it's funny, each one of those books impacted me. And I read a lot. And these are the small, it's probably 20, 25 books that have been really powerful for me. I think a lot about market history and I love talking with investors that, you know, were investing during key periods. So, and, you know, and just sort of learning the lessons of what they did. So I was, I was actually talking with one of my mentors, Ralph Akinpora earlier today, and we were talking about the period of the 1960s, 1970s. He was relating the current market with euphoria and an uptrend that just persisted with the 1960s, which was a very similar period. They call it the go-go years on Wall Street. And so, you know, the first book that jumps off the page of me is Edwin Lefebvre's Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, which is kind of a classic book talking about Jesse Livermore and sort of painting this picture of this larger-than-life investor in the 1920s. And he really thrived during this rotation from a euphoric period of market history to a depression, to a destructive period in market history. Uh, But it talks all about the bucket shops. And a lot of the lessons from that book have very little to do with the structure of the market today. But the human psychology, the human element is very similar. And as much as we've automated things and changed things and timeframes have changed and just the market participants have changed, The fact that humans are still buying and selling stocks driven by fear and greed, I think, is still very, very relevant. So, you know, reading through that book and other books like uh, Once in Golconda, which should deal with a similar period around that sort of 20s and 30s period, I think are fascinating reads and tell you a lot about the structures in the market that we're seeing now really started, really launched back in that period. Yeah, I think it's very valuable to kind of really test your assumptions. And obviously, one of your books on the list by Tim Ferriss, The 4-Hour Workweek, he talks a lot about testing your assumptions. But I think another book that really highlights that is also Fooled by Randomness by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. I've read both that one and The Black Swan. And it really kind of highlights the importance of always trying to think from the other side of the road or, again, testing your assumptions, right? It's so true. And I read it earlier on in my career, I feel like, As I learned technical analysis and I learned about the ability to quantify investor behavior, and that's what really drew me to charts and to analyzing things visually, was it was a way to get inside other investors' heads and try to quantify what they were thinking and what was motivating their investment decisions. And when I learned there's a discipline that allowed you to do that, I was totally hooked on it. But what that book reminds you is that 
we are basically wired to see a lot more patterns than are actually there, right? And I think it's the way we don't lose our mind by a world that is infinitely complex and chaotic and diverse. So we try to oversimplify. We try to stereotype. We try to group things together mentally. And we try to see patterns even when no pattern is there. And I think, you know, for me, I think as you learn technical analysis, it's very easy to, number one, think that the process of investing using charts is very easy. <laughs> and the second one is that you can figure anything out if you just find the right patterns. And for me, I think using charts for now 20 plus years, it's more often dealing with when things don't work out as you'd expect. It's not that you can just figure out some pattern or some signal or some indicator that just works all the time. And all you need to do is follow it. And what worries me now is, you know, when I fire up YouTube, the ads that run before my videos are people telling you that's kind of the idea. All you need to do is find this one thing and then you just trade a couple minutes a day and you're good because it's super easy. And I think what I've learned is that it's super not easy and that <laughs> finding those times when it doesn't work and how you deal with that is how you grow as an investor. And that's when you really earn your keep. And those are the lessons that allow you to invest another day. So his books really are about, for me, it reminded me to be disciplined and always think of things in terms of probabilistic outcomes. Here's what's most likely to happen, but here are some other alternate scenarios that certainly could happen. And what am I going to do in each of those situations? And that I think is what allows you to not lose your mind investing. Yeah, and I think a great example in the book that really illustrates that is he talks about being able to correlate the temperature on the ground in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, to a certain price chart of a stock. <laughs> and it's, you know, you think you can find a pattern anywhere, yet they don't necessarily correlate. Correlation does not always equal causation, right? It's absolutely right. And I, I mean, I've spent time, uh, you know, reading a lot of Bob Prechter's books on socionomics and things like that, and, and have enjoyed getting to know Bob and talking to him about things. And the last time I spoke to him, we were talking about this. You know, we, we love to oversimplify. And even even when things think they should make sense, like even looking at stocks versus gold or lumber prices versus stocks or whatever different comparison you want to make, even if you can justify it for some reason, those correlations are never 100% consistent, right? They're very fluid. So for every time that stocks and gold move together, I can show you a different time where they move inversely to one another. So, you know, we, we love to assume that there are certainties, that there are immutable laws. And uh, Andy Lowe's a professor at MIT and a, and a great champion, did some great academic work on behavioral finance and technical analysis. He always talks about the physics of finance that we want to have these immutable laws, these rules that are absolutely set and all you need to do is figure them out and you kind of get it. And just the markets are chaotic. They're unpredictable as much as we want to do it. We're not predicting the future. It's all about just analyzing probabilities, analyzing market history and looking at what could happen and trying to identify, you know, how you should be positioned in different scenarios. And, and again, I think we very much want to hope and assume that someone has it figured out and that there are relationships you just have to figure out and then it becomes super easy. And I just, it never gets that easy, <laughs> you know? Yeah, no doubt. Another perfect example would be the US dollar and gold moving mm. obviously are non-correlated or inversely correlated, but we've seen both correlation and inverse correlation this year. So that would be a good example of that. Going through a lot of your work, I came across a sentence that you wrote a blog on about being mindful the rest of the time. So what does that mean to you when you're thinking about how your investment thesis plays out? Well, so, you know, for me, I've thought a lot about, you know, mindfulness and how it relates to investing. And for me, you know, I learned about meditation. I learned about it during a stressful period of my life. And I was struggling to just manage a lot of things personally, professionally, and finding plenty of unhealthy ways to deal with it. And I was introduced to meditation. It was a total life changer for me. I mean, it was a pivotal experience to learning how you could address thoughts in your head, how you could relate to those, and then having a much better toolkit to relate to the world around you. And so for a while, that sort of helped me deal with my personal life. And then my professional career was still just sort of focusing on the trends, focusing on the charts. And when I started to combine them, I came up with sort of uh, the idea of the mindful investor, which is what my blog is called on stockcharts.com. And it's all about basically applying those lessons of mindfulness to investing. Uh, and, you know, for me, the beauty of mindfulness or what it means to me is basically having an awareness, having a calmness of your perspective to 
have an awareness of what's happening on, uh, around you. And I think a lot of times as human beings and also for sure as investors, you know, we're sort of in a cloud. We're numbing ourselves to what's going on around us. We're very focused maybe on one thing and we forget to pay attention to gather all the evidence, gather all the information. If you just uh, look around and, and have the sense to uh, to be aware and so for me, I always coach clients to what I what I call a uh, market awareness or a situational awareness, which is basically learning to have a regular process for understanding what's happening around you. And there's a calmness. There's a there's a benefit that happens with having that awareness, having that understanding. So, you know, for me, you know, mindfulness relating to investing is really more about looking at the, the appropriate information, having the right mindset with which to approach what's happening and don't let your emotions take over when something goes against you. You should have a game plan in mind that only comes by having a calmness by approaching all the different potential outcomes and how you would adapt to all of those. So as you speak about having this game plan as you go into any of these investing situations, I'd like to get some of your thoughts on key parts of your investment thesis. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what are some of the key pieces of your investment thesis? Like, do you have several different legs of the stool or, or how do you mm. approach that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when I'm thinking of the overall market environment, just trying to ha have sense of things, you know, for me, there's a there's a weekly routine that is really important to me. And it basically hits on a couple of different key areas. It starts with top down analysis, top down macro point of view, what's working and what isn't. And it's really more of an asset allocation view. And then second to that is sector rotation, what sectors are working, what sectors are not. And then at the bottom, it's bottom up stock picking and it's understanding the patterns that relate to them. And I've often found just doing one or two of those, you're missing out on some key information from the others. And so looking at all of those together can be really powerful. And, and I should say for certain, when you're looking at that first question, which is that I would argue the most important question for investors, which is that asset allocation question. What do I see about the overall market environment and where do I expect things to head? For me, that has three pieces. It starts with price and then breadth and then sentiment. And it's in that priority order. So regardless of what you hear, regardless of what you think could happen with all the macro headwinds and tailwinds, coronavirus, the elections, geopolitical issues, earnings, any of that, the number one question you need to answer as an investor is price. What is the price doing? And how are the trends evolving across these different asset classes? How do I relate the movements in stocks to commodities, to currencies, to interest rates and any other components within there? So it has to start with price because that is a reflection of what investors are doing, what they're voting with their capital with each of those different assets. And then after that, it's breadth, which is basically qualifying what you see in price by looking at some of the supporting data. So, you know, one of the key things I'd be looking at right now is, is some of the weakness that you see from breadth measures like advanced decline lines, uh, the percent of stocks above their 50 day moving average. These are all ways that you see that the S&P 500 is doing one thing or the TSX is doing one thing. But what about all the companies that make up that index? Are you starting to see certain companies diverge from the overall market move? And that tends to happen at inflection points when the market's starting to turn. And then the third piece after price and then breadth is sentiment, which is price tells you what people are voting with their capital, with their money. Breadth tells you what bets they're actually making by looking at the components of each of those broad asset classes. And then sentiment tells you how they're what they're saying they're doing, which is, you know, things like survey data and the VIX volatility and trying to get a read on the movements in price and how that might relate to what investors are thinking. And I found if you combine those in a consistent way and the consistency is what's most important. So for me, it's a weekly routine of going through a whole series of charts and updating my thinking every week. You certainly won't be caught off guard by changes in market dynamics because you've had a consistent way of analyzing each of those three points. Very interesting, David. I'd like to spend a little bit more time drilling in on what you mean by breadth. Can you define it for us a little clearer and maybe give us a couple examples of the types of indicators that you look at to inform your breadth information that you need to pull out of the markets? Absolutely. So if you think about the beginning of 2020, uh, you know, sort of that January, December 2019, January, February of 2020, if we look at that sort of two to three month period, it's a great example of the benefits of looking at breadth. And what I mean by breadth is if you look at a chart of the S&P 500, December, January, February, the market continuing to make higher highs and higher lows. So by Charles Dow's definition from 
100 plus years ago, the market is in an uptrend by definition, right? The trend is going up. Breadth is basically, I always call it looking under the hood of the markets. If the broad index is doing one thing, what are all the stocks that make up the index? What are they actually doing? And an example that sort of illustrate what we're doing is, is called the advanced decline line, which is basically saying at the end of every trading day, how many stocks in a certain universe closed higher than yesterday's close? How many stocks closed lower than yesterday's close? And that gives you the daily advancers, decliners for that particular day. On day X, 60% of the index closed up, 40% of the index closed down. The real benefit of this is looking at it over time. So you do what's called a cumulative advanced decline line. So every day you keep a running total of advancers minus decliners. And over time, you get this line that shows you overall over a sequence of many, many days, weeks, months, how many stocks are closing higher or lower. Because what happened in January and February of 2020 is pretty common at market tops where the market index continues to go higher, but the cumulative advanced decline line starts to roll down. It actually made a lower high in February. So as the price was going to a new high, this measure of breadth, advancers minus decliners, was actually making a lower high. Now, how can that actually happen where the index can go up and this breadth line can go down? It goes to leadership and it goes to what's actually doing the move-in. For something like the S&P 500, it's a, and I, I'm sorry if I'm going into too much detail, but hopefully this clarifies things for everyone. The S&P 500, most broad indexes are called cap weighted, market cap weighted, which means the largest stocks in the index have a huge weight in the performance of the index. So stocks like Apple and Amazon and Exxon Mobil and all these other ones, and at this point it's really tech, consumer, communication services, Alphabet, Facebook. These are the big mega cap stocks and their movements on a day have an outsized impact on the change in the S&P 500 because it's weighted by the market capitalization. It's weighted by essentially the size of the company and how it's capitalized, which means a smaller stock, a you know a stock number 500 out of the S&P 500 has a pretty minimal impact on the overall movement of the index. When you look at the advanced decline line, it's an equal weighted measure. So you're basically saying out of the 500 stocks or whatever universe you're looking at, How many closed up? How many closed down? It's not weighting it by any particular factor. So it's more of an equal weighted measure. It's more of a better measure of overall market participation. So what happened in January, February, the price of the S&P went higher. A lot of breadth measures actually turned lower, made a lower high, which spoke to the fact that it was a relatively small number of larger stocks that were continuing in an uptrend. A lot of stocks had already started to roll over, and that was a bit of an early warning signal that it was at the later phases of the bull market run. Similar things happened at the uh, 2007 market high where the Russell 2000, other uh, you know breadth indicators and, and such sort of rolled over before the market made its final high. And you saw the same thing in uh, in March of 2000. So it's, it's a very classic bull market sort of configuration. And breadth tells you participation. Breadth is all about how stocks are participating in the overall movement in the broad equity market. So if we take that perspective, David, can you explain to us a little bit about another article you wrote about the end of the FANG trade and explain to us kind of looking at it through that lens of those major indicators, price, breadth and sentiment? Sure. So, I mean, we've talked a lot. I I think a lot of uh, strategists have talked about the FANG trade and and it's it's evolved into many names, the FANG man trade, the MAGA trade, whatever, because it's this nebulous mix of mega cap tech consumer and communication services names that have just had an incredible run. And if you look at the relative performance, so there's a there's an index, the New York Fang Plus Index. It's an NYSE Fang Index, and it includes a bunch of other stocks in there as well, Chinese internet names and and, uh, and a mix of things. But overall, the relative performance has been staggering. It's just it's outperformed the broader equity market in a very big way over the last year, for sure. And so because those stocks have done so well, the challenge is, or I guess the the reason why they continue to do well, is institutional money managers that are benchmarked uh, versus the S&P, meaning they run a $10 billion fund and your benchmark is the S&P 500, your job is to outperform that index. And what happens when a stock like Apple or Facebook or Alphabet is doing well and it starts to really outperform As an institutional money manager, you have to own that stock. It's not a question of whether or not you kind of want to own Facebook. You literally have to own Facebook because there is a career risk with not owning that stock because you have to go in front of your clients and justify why you don't own one of the biggest names in your benchmark that is having an incredible run of performance. And you're most likely underperforming your benchmark if you don't own those stocks. 
So what happens is as those stocks continue to work, there's a herding mentality because money managers have to be in there. They have to own those names. As a result, the uptrend will perpetuate and those stocks continue to do well. And that's the phenomenon that we've seen for quite a while now. Now, when I talk about the end of the FANG trade, there's that unwind that has to happen at some point. At some point, that trade stops working and all of a sudden there is a huge run to the exits when people just like you had to be in them when they work, you certainly don't want to be in them when they start not working. And what's interesting is uh, if you look in the last couple weeks here, you know, we're in mid-September, you know, you've arguably started to see the beginning of that rotation. There's a bit of a head fake in maybe in June to July where you saw maybe a rotation away from big cap tech into other sectors, but technology took over and once again got in the driver's seat. But now we're starting to see a rotation away from technology into things like materials and industrials and, you know, arguably even financials. These are sectors that are starting to emerge and do pretty well. So that FANG trade and, and sort of the evolution of it is, I think, one of the biggest questions investors have to answer. What happens traditionally when a market really starts to roll over, the very last thing to drop would be the big defensive places that people have been parking. And if you look at the relative performance of technology, even just the XLK, you, you'll see that it's just been a consistent outperformer, even as the markets pulled back over all the relative strength over the last year or two has still been very, very strong. And so what happened in a normal bull market top is you would start to see weakening breadth as a lot of stocks start to struggle, especially mid and small cap stocks or sort of the smaller names. The FANG trade, the big defensive stocks, which those have essentially become, would usually be the last to sort of roll over, which means the price of the index continues to appreciate as those stocks do well and people try to ride things out in those names. But once people recognize they don't, that's where sentiment sort of has become euphoric as people have expected that this trend will never go down again. And we've seen those uh, those markers of extreme euphoria. If you look at things like put call ratios and name exposure, which is looking at active investment managers and how they're exposed to stocks versus other asset classes are essentially all in on equities right now in the, in the last couple of weeks. We've seen breadth start to roll over. The very last thing that tends to happen is the price starting to roll over. And, and I think that's what you're looking at now is where we are at relative to key support levels that might indicate that the run in equities uh, might be at an end. So if we look at the chart that you were gracious enough to send me before we started recording of the S&P 500, do we see any of those indicators starting to roll over on this particular chart? Absolutely. So the chart of the S&P, I mean, the first thing that stands out is you look at how the S&P made new highs. And that was that was obviously key. I remember talking to a strategist back at like S&P 2500 who threw out this objective of S&P 3600. And that sounded like the most ridiculous <laughs> thing I'd ever heard, you know, someone actually articulate. And I still I had to completely eat it and reach out to him last week and say, all right, you win. We hit we, you know, we didn't quite hit 3600, but close enough that I'm impressed at the call. I mean, that was, that was a nice that was a nice move. But what's happened, though, is if you look at what has happened, especially during the later phases, I think things changed a lot from March to June and then from June to September. And that peak in June and when we went to new highs, that's when we saw a reemergence of technology leadership. That's when we saw a reemergence of consumer discretionary, especially stocks like Amazon. And that's one of the lines that you see at the bottom of that chart is the relative performance of consumer discretionary versus the S&P, which has just been on an incredible run really since the market low in March, but really has accelerated in the last uh, in the last couple months since the pullback in June. What's happened there sectors like technology, consumer discretionary have really reemerged in a position of strength and have pushed us up to this point of S&P 3600. Now, while that has happened, a couple other things have been key. Sentiment, as I mentioned, has, I would argue, reached euphoric levels by most measures. And things like the put call ratio are at extreme lows, meaning options investors are, are essentially all in, you know, buying calls and expecting the market to continue to go to go higher. By any measure I've seen of investor positioning, you see people outweighed into equities. But the really key line on this particular chart is the line in red right in the middle, which is very subjectively but appropriately color coded red, which is showing you the rotation in breadth. If you look at the month of August, you can see how the S&P made a huge swing higher into the first week in September. That was last week right now. Look at the common stock only advanced decline line, the cumulative advanced decline line making a lower peak. It's very similar to what you saw if you look uh, about two thirds of the way to the left on the chart, January and February with the market going to new highs and the, uh, the breadth lines rolling over. I'm not showing the breadth here in the mid cap index and the small cap index, but 
they all look very similar to this, making a new swing low, making a lower high, and now breaking to new lows. While the S&P is holding up, remaining above its 50-day moving average, has not quite made a lower low yet. All the breadth measures that are that are very important to me have made a new uh, a new swing low. The only one that has not is the S and P 500 breadth, which is still sort of neutral. And I think that speaks to the fact that it's the largest companies that have continued to hold up, while sort of the average stock, that sort of middle smaller cap uh, name, has already started to break down. And so I, I think we're seeing signs of bull market tops. If you look back at market history, we're starting to see them now. Excellent. So Lynn, let's contrast the S&P chart with the gold chart and tell us why this is a far more bullish chart. Absolutely. So, you know, it's funny when I've looked at the at market performance over the last year, when you think about January to February, I remember doing a presentation in mid-February. And one of the things I pointed out was we have this situation where everything is moving together. Stocks, bonds, gold, even the dollar, all at that point, we're all starting to rotate higher. And when that happens, that is completely unsustainable. At least one of those has to break very quickly. And it's all about which one is going to rotate and why. And what happened then is, as you know, stocks broke pretty quickly and that sort of rotated out. Everything else sort of, you know, really fluctuated through February into March. But gold is a chart that actually resolved after that sort of shock into a low in mid-March, really resolved back to the upside. And what gold ended up doing is it's had this pattern over the last two years, which is what we're looking at here where there's a big push higher, a push to new highs. There's a bit of a pullback, a corrective move, where as the, you know, the, the momentum was overbought, it kind of comes off a little bit. The RSI, which is a measure of momentum, usually bottoms out around uh, 40 to, to 50, uh, 30, 30, 40, 50 area, which is highlighted in pink on the chart, which basically is, usually means a reasonable pullback within an uptrend. And then both of those times, if you look in 2019, uh, the beginning of the year, and also late 2019, both sort of resolved higher. What we've seen now going into the last couple months is gold became extremely overbought with an RSI above 80, which is actually relatively rare. And what it speaks to is extreme upside momentum. This is when gold, the gold trade felt like it was going vertical, which it really did. It was sort of this parabolic rise to the upside. And when that happens, we've arguably seen a parabolic rise in, in stocks here, too. When that happens, it you know, you have to have a pullback. You have to have a what I call a digestion period, which I think is with gold is what we're looking at right now. You have to have a period where that euphoric rise sort of tapers off a little bit. People that had been long and strong and very happy to take profits sort of digest all of those. And, and you think about it sort of building up momentum for the next like higher. What you're seeing with gold is this pattern where it's consolidating. You sort of have this consolidative pattern now of lower highs and higher lows. And that's a consolidation. You call that a symmetrical triangle or a coil if you're a chartist. And what that essentially means is we are getting into an equilibrium for the price, which is right to, right around 1950 or give or take a couple points. And what's happening is that's right around a 38.2% retracement off of the highs. If you take the low from March and you write that up to the high that we saw in August, it's a little bit lower. It's around 18, like 1850 or so, I want to say, is that first level. But we're sort of hitting that stabilization, stabilization period right above the 50-day moving average. And what's happening now is just like everything was rallying in early August, everything for the most part has kind of pulled back a little bit. Gold has pulled back. Stocks have pulled back. Bonds have pulled back. The dollar has, is probably the outlier being in a pretty good downtrend and then recovering pretty well. Right now for gold, along with stocks and other assets, is which assets are able to hold their 50-day moving average and continue the next leg like, higher. And the corrective pattern I'm seeing in gold looks very similar to other times when it's been you know, sort of building momentum and prepared to make the, uh, the next leg like, higher. So overall, it's actually... Setting up pretty well as a as a sort of what I'd call a bull market pullback. It's sort of the pause that refreshes before the next leg higher overall, which, you know, again, I hate to oversimplify that. My base case is sort of further weakness in stocks as I think that, you know, I think we have a lot more in terms of price and time to digest all the gains that we've seen through the peak in early September. I think with gold, it's done a lot of consolidation here in the last month or so and, and certainly has the potential for further upside that would line up pretty well with the uh, with the outlook for stocks. So after looking at both these charts, David, you also speak about, you know, timing your entry and exit points. And basically, I'd like to talk about timing entry points and getting calls correct versus managing risk and clearly defining an exact strategy. So can you tell us a bit about your psychology and your framework before you approach a trade like this? <laughs> it's, it's such a great question. And I think I 
you know, I sort of mentioned it earlier. I, you know, when I'm coaching clients, I spend a lot of time working with financial advisors and helping them understand and, and hopefully inject more discipline into their decision making process. And we talk about three steps to what I call three steps to behavioral investing. And it basically starts with information. All right. Let's understand behavioral biases. Let's understand charts and technical analysis and how the latter can help you address the former in a pretty good way. The second part of that is application. Let's take all that. Let's take all those tools and start applying it to charts like the one of gold or, or the S&P that we've just talked about and try to make some analysis of it. But the third and I would argue the most challenging and the most valuable piece is what I call integration, which is actually integrating these ideas into an investment process, because it's very easy to look at a chart of gold and analyze it and just say, here's what I think is happening. But what you need to do as an investor is make an asset allocation decision and and have a way of understanding how gold looks relative to other bets, other levers you could be pulling. And, and, you know, thinking about commodities as a complex, thinking about precious metals as a subset and thinking of gold versus silver and whatever, you know, anything that you could do. It, there's this whole set of decisions you ha- you have to make. And it's not about making that decision one time. It's about having a consistent process for doing that. So for me, the way that you minimize the emotional and not make an emotional reaction and an emotional decision is having a consistent framework to be able to analyze the charts consistently. So for me, it's all about I, I start with checklists, to be honest. And I and in many ways, I force clients to write down or put it in an Excel spreadsheet. OK, here are the questions that you will answer before you have earned the right to determine what you're doing with this chart. And so, it you know, for me, it starts with trend and it gets to moving averages and it gets to support levels and resistance levels. It looks at momentum. It looks at relative performance. How does that asset compare to other assets? And you have to go through this checklist of things. And in the end, you have to assign a conclusion, right? Here's what I think about this. This is how I would rate this chart relative to others. But the real value is over time, seeing how those conclusions evolve and seeing how they change. And the most important thing is, if you would look at a chart like this during your process and say, all right, Gold looks like a good entry point. It's long term, pretty strong. It's pulled back to a relatively viable point. I think this is a buy. I always tell people when the market, when the trade starts going against you, that is not the time to be developing your exit strategy. The time to do it is right when you right when you put the trade on. The full sentence is not I am bullish on gold or I am buying gold today. The complete sentence is. I am buying gold, and if X, Y, Z happens, I will be selling this position. Or when this scenario occurs, I will take this action. And you that is all one big thought that you make. And I find a lot of times it's very easy to just sort of say what looks good, what does not look good. But when you're actually trying to make a decision on it, you have to have a way of systematizing those conclusions and looking at them over time. And by doing that exercise regularly, by having a set time every week, every day, whatever it is, every month, whatever it is to review the charts, review your conclusions, how they've evolved, how your thinking has changed, and whether or not it justifies taking action. I think that's arguably the toughest part in terms of integrating into your decision making, but arguably the most important thing uh, that you can do. Absolutely, David. Anything else you'd like to add as we wrap up here? Uh, no, I, I, all of your listeners uh, should know that um, you were by far, as I, as I mentioned, when we first started talking, you shared all the things you'd already read about stuff I had done. You were the most prepared interviewer I think I have ever dealt with. So people should know that you do your homework and make this incredibly easy. And thank you for everything you did to, to make me sound pretty knowledgeable. I appreciate that. That is your doing for sure. No, I, I you know, for me, I, my goal, you know, over, over my career and, and what I've been able to do, you, you know, launching my own firm and my blog market misbehavior is really to try to empower investors to make better decisions. And I found over my career, a lot of people struggling, either struggling with the personal implications of the stress and the time that they're focused on the markets and on work versus balancing that with other things or just having unhealthy routines that cause them to make mistakes and just they don't recover from those mistakes very well. And I, you know, for me, applying the lessons of mindfulness, applying, you know, thinking about having an awareness of the markets by having a toolkit that helps you understand them consistently, I, I would argue is the most important thing you can do. So if I can inspire anyone listening to, you know, look at your own routines and focus on what do you do first thing every morning? What, when you get your cup of coffee, what do you, what steps do you take first thing? And what, what's one thing you could upgrade there? Do you have a a regular weekly routine that you, uh, that you sit down? It's funny. I was talking with Ralph Eckenport, as I mentioned earlier, he he said every Sunday afternoon, he used to have M&M time, Mansfields and Merlot and Mansfield charts were these 
uh, you know, these charts that these print physical charts that used to get shipped out every week. And he would flip through the paper charts with a glass of wine. That was his routine. So what is your M&M time? What is your weekly routine? When are you reviewing how things have changed and how are you tracking your changing and thought, uh, your, your, how your thoughts have evolved over time? And again, I, I, I'd hope people can think about how they could upgrade their routines. Even one incremental change this week, uh, hopefully many of those over time starts to make a real difference. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, David. Maybe we should start calling you the holistic investor. <laughs> Because you think of it as a whole piece, a whole package, right? Yeah, and I, I mean, if there's one thing I've learned over my career, and I, and I think it's, you know, social media has certainly changed that. Just my transition from working at large firms uh, like Bloomberg and Fidelity to working at smaller shops and launching my own firm, I have, you know, realized the benefits of bringing my own genuine self with all of my imperfections to what I'm doing. And, and yeah, the moment I started drawing on things I did outside of investing and allowing it to, to help me become a better investor, it's just been it's been a much happier experience for sure, much more fulfilling. Yeah, I bet. We can find your work and, and you put out a ton of valuable content, David, either stockcharts.com, Sierra Alpha Research, the Market Misbehavior blog, and most of all, all those links are all available on your Twitter at dkellercmt, correct? Absolutely right, Tom. Anywhere else you'd like to mention? No, I think that's it. I marketmisbehavior.com is my main uh, is my main page, and I try to take everything I put elsewhere, including Twitter and all that, try to put it in one place. So if you want to learn more about what I do, that's a that's a great place to uh, to do it. The last thing I would say is I, you know, one of the things that I created a little while ago is a uh, behavioral investing course. I basically a, a course on mindful investing. I call it the five modes of mindful investors. And if you go to my website, there's a link to sign up for it. It's just a five week email experience to nudge your thinking on uh, five key parts of investing more mindfully. So if it's of interest to you, that's a good place to check it out. Yeah. You also have a free trading course on the website. Is that the same thing? Yep, that's exactly right. So it's a it's a five week course. You sign up for it and then it'll basically email you a video with some uh, with some questions to get you thinking. And and the feedback I've gotten for people that have gone through it is it's funny <laughs> in a lot of ways. I'm told that I tell them what they already knew, but they just didn't have the, you know, they just didn't take the time to recognize that was actually happening. So if I can do that for you, I'm, I am happy to serve that role. Perfect, David. Well, there's a bunch of stuff we didn't get to, like the five items on your bull market checklist. Many more things on my list here, but hopefully we can have you back soon. We'll do it again sometime. Thanks again. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip-your-face-off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on at Yemen?